Each lung contains approximately 150 million alveoli, individual little sets of balls. If you spread all those out, you would have almost twice the size of a baseball diamond. Now, not the whole baseball field, but just the diamond. Just the, yeah, just the infield. Almost two of That's a lot of surface area. And so each one of those alveoli are covered by a little network of capillaries. Which is kind of cool. So you have this huge area for gas exchange. So what you have is the oxygen is going to, going to diffuse out of the alveolus into the capillary, the carbon dioxide is going to go the other way. And that's what I've demonstrated or wrong word here. This would be one alveolus, this would be the capillary. So oxygen diffuses from the out from the space inside the alveolus, and the capillary carbon dioxide goes the other way. That's called the um, basal lamina or basement membrane. It's a protein that basically fuses the wall of the capillary to the wall of the alveolus. All right, so if you look at an, alve <coughs> an alveolus, there are basically four types of cells. The main type of cell is what we call the type one cell or the simple squamous epithelial tissue. So that's what this is, just simple squamous epithelial tissue. Flat, thin, plate-like cells. <coughs> now, Ever so often, you have a type 2 cell. That's this funny looking little guy. You don't have a lot of them, but you have a couple of them, maybe I don't know, two or three for a or something like that. These guys produce something called surfactant. Surfactant feels, you know when you get dishwashing detergent <laughs> on your hands, like Dawn? It's got that slick feeling to it. That's kind of what this surfactant does. It's kind of like almost like a detergent in a way. And it puts a real thin film on the inside of the alveolus. And what that does is it reduces the surface tension of water. Remember that water molecules are polar. They attract one another. And so without the surfactant, these alveoli, these are tiny, these are microscopic, the alveoli would tend to collapse, would tend to stick together. And so the surfactant reduces that attraction between the water molecules, reduces that surface tension. So it allows the alveoli to, to stay open. When um, the lungs are the last part to develop in a, in a fetus, because obviously they're getting their oxygenated blood from, from the mother. And so one of the last things to develop in the lungs is this surfactant. So if the baby's in distress or the, or the labor starts early, <coughs> what they do is they'll do an amphibiosynthesis and they will do what's called an LS ratio. It's called a less than single myelin ratio. Those are two of the main components in the surfactant. And if that ratio is not right, they know the kid's lungs aren't mature enough to survive outside the womb. So they try to hold the pregnancy, hold the delivery off until that happens. Okay. Now, where we talked about, we talked about the blood, we're talking about the um, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. We said that the monocytes didn't hang out in the blood very long. They got out into uh, the tissues and became macrophages. Some of them become the, we become them. <laughs> become of these, uh, <laughs> become these alveolar macrophages, and they just kind of crawl around inside the alveoli looking for stuff to eat. Now, one of the problems with um, a disease like tuberculosis, tuberculosis is a bacterial infection, um, that organism has a very waxy coating on the out outer surface of the cells, and the alveolar macrophages can eat the tuberculous bacteria, but they can't kill them because of the waxy coating. And so tuberculosis, what the body does is you basically get these little calcifications where you've got um, basically a, it's called a granuloma. It's a little wad of connective tissue and fibroblasts and alveolar macrophages and, and immune cells with bacteria inside of that. All the body can do is wall that off. Now those bacteria are still alive. And if something happens to your immune system and that, that little granuloma breaks down, then you've got an active case of tuberculosis. That's all. <laughs> but most of the time, these alveolar macrophages do a good job. And then fibroblasts, you don't see them, but in between the alveoli, there's capillary, there's the alveolus, and then all this stuff in here, 
they're fibroblasts producing the elastic and reticular tissues because the lung um, has a great capacity to expand and contract as, it, as inhalation and exhalation occur. And that's because of those elastic bones. Down at this area where the wall of the alveolus and the wall of the capillary come together, that area is called the respiratory membrane. And what it consists of is the squamous epithelial cell of the alveolus. The squamous epithelial cell or, or endothelial cell. They're all squamous epithelial cells. Endothelial cell of the capillary. And then the little protein, a little bit thin layer called the fused basal lamina. Again, that's just the proteins that are basically um, having those two things stick together, holding them together so there's not a lot of space between them. And this is, of course, I've drawn it big so we can see it, but this is very, very, very thin. Now the cool thing that you have to remember is oxygen and carbon dioxide are lipid soluble substances. They're not very water soluble, but they are very lipid soluble. And so it's very easy that by simple diffusion, these gases can diffuse right through the cell membranes of the squamous epithelial cell, that squamous epithelial cell, and that squamous epithelial cell. So this is very thin, and you don't have to have any special transport proteins or anything because they're lipid soluble. The problem with pneumonia. In pneumonia, what happens is fluid builds up in the alveoli. Well, in pneumonia, that's what happens, is that you get, you get fluid collecting inside the alveoli <clears throat> from, the, from the infection or um, what, a couple of things. Um, it could be um, damage to the endothelial, cell, endothelial cells themselves. It could be um, if you've got an infection and the alveolar macrophages are eating the bacteria, they're also sending out signals to, bring, to make these capillaries leaky, so fluid can leak in that way. So in uh, pneumonia, what happens is you get fluid inside the alveoli. In pulmonary edema, you get fluid in between here. But the, either way, what happens is oxygen and carbon dioxide cannot diffuse through that fluid. That's water, basically. And so that's why it inhibits gas exchange. All right, then emphysema. What happens in emphysema, instead of having all these tiny, tiny, you know, 300 million, basically, in both lungs, alveoli, the alveolar walls are destroyed, and so instead of having lots and lots of little bitty alveoli, you have these big cavities. You lose surface area. And again, you have less contact between the wall of the alveolus and the wall of the capillary because you don't have as many of these. So you've got to ventilate, breathe in, move more air in and out to get the same amount of oxygen into the bloodstream and the same amount of carbon dioxide out. When we think about respiration on a or um, organismal scale, a whole body scale, and a macroscopic scale. Basically, you've got four parts. You have getting the air in and out. We call that pulmonary ventilation. You have what's called external respiration, which is what's happening here. So at the lungs, What's happening is oxygen is entering the bloodstream, carbon dioxide is leaving. That's external respiration. Once this oxygenated blood or oxygen-rich blood goes back to the heart and then out the aorta and everywhere else in the body, you have what's called internal respiration. And here the opposite happens. Oxygen diffuses out of the blood into the tissues, and carbon dioxide goes the other way. Out of the cells, into the interstitial fluid, into the bloodstream. One of the most important things to understand from today is the difference between external respiration and internal respiration. External respiration happens at the pulmonary cap. Internal respiration happens at all the other capillaries, the systemic capillaries. So when you're reading test questions or reading the textbook, think about where you are in the body. Am I talking about what's going on in the lungs? Because if the lungs, oxygen goes into the bloodstream. If I'm talking about everywhere else, oxygen is leaving the bloodstream. All right, 
So honestly, you have to get air in and out of the alveoli. That's the pulmonary ventilation. Then you've got external respiration and internal respiration. But in between these two things, I just said oxygen and carbon dioxide are not very water soluble. Well, most of your blood is water, right? So you have to have a way to transport the gases in the bloodstream. Oxygen and carbon dioxide don't dissolve well in water. So to connect these two things, you have to have the gas transport. Make sense? We think of uh, respiratory rate, but actually what we're, what we, you know, how fast, how many times somebody breathe in a minute? We call it respiratory rate, but really it's ventilation rate. You know, that's a, the word respiration can be used in a whole bunch of different ways. I hate when they do stuff. Now, this dude Boyle, and he said that the volume of a gas is indirectly proportional to the pressure. So what that means is, with gases, if you, if they're under high pressure or if they you make the volume small, then what happens is all the little gas molecules are bouncing around and they're creating more pressure, like inside of a balloon. Um, if you increase the volume, you decrease the pressure because it takes longer for the little molecule to hit the wall of the container. Does that make sense? Okay. You can have the same amount or the same number of molecules, but depending on the volume, it controls how much pressure is created. Okay. Now, you probably know this already, but just in case, remember that the diaphragm in the relaxed state is a dome. Right under your lungs, liver, sit right over there. So when that muscle contracts, it flattens out. And what it does is it decreases, since you're, you're increasing the volume of the lung cavity, of the thoracic cavity, you're decreasing the pressure. And so what happens is the, the pressure inside your lungs is less than the air pressure, and air rushes in. When the diaphragm relaxes, it decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity, increasing the pressure, forcing air in. Of the air that you breathe is nitrogen. 
So if you take the 760 millimeters of mercury, multiply that by 78%, 0.786, right? That gives you 597 millimeters of mercury. That's the partial pressure of nitrogen gas in the room air. And uh, see, look. Again, do the same thing. You're not going to have to know these numbers, but I'm just pointing it out, pointing out to you the differences. So the air that we take into the lungs, that we inspire when we inhale, has very little carbon dioxide, just a tiny, tiny amount of carbon dioxide. Um, and then much a significant, a significantly higher amount of oxygen than carbon dioxide. But most of it's nitrogen. Okay, so what happens based on Henry's law, if we can if we can decrease the volume, we're going to increase the pressure, right? Right? So we put more pressure on this, we're decreasing the volume, all these little gas molecules are bouncing around, and so we can force more of that gas into the fluid. diffuses out to the room air because there's not much out there. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high in here. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is low out here. It's just diffusion. Instead of concentration, it's from high from an area of high partial pressure to an area of low partial pressure. So in the lungs, the partial pressure of the oxygen is higher here than in here. In the systemic capillaries, the partial pressure of oxygen is higher here than it is here. And then carbon dioxide is the other thing. 